Hello and welcome to Kushti TV, the Straight Talking YouTube channel. Yes, I've got a treat for you today. Come in and speak into the camera for the first time ever. He has written a book on the cobbles, but he's never been in front of camera like this, speaking about his life as a bare knuckle fighter. Of course, it is the legendary hard man amongst hard men, Mr. Jimmy Stockings. Welcome, Jimmy. Hi, Joe. All right, my old mate. Hi, mate. How is things? All right? Hi, mate. Yeah, All the family good, everything? Fine lovely, and dandy? Mate. Yeah, lovely, yeah. Well, that always helps, mate. When we got that, we got most things, haven't we, eh? That's it, mate. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so, uh, Jimmy, you were born in St. Ilya, um, London, uh, just on the edge of London, Greater London, we might call it St. Ilya, in 1957. 58, mate. 1958, beg your pardon, right, well stand corrected, what a silly old journalist I am, messing things up. Born in 1958, St Ilya, London, um, to parents Jim Smith and Elizabeth Carter. Um, your dad was commonly known as the Jim Stockings, Muggy Stockings, and your mum would be better known as Betty, or Betsy. Um, so tell me, Jim, it wasn't going to be, life was never going to be an easy journey for you, in the nicest way. I know you're a man that loves life and lives it, but it was never going to be easy. As a little boy, um, in your, right in your infancy, you were form, um, born with your, your feet, um, I think they call it back to front or displaced as a name for it, and you struggled walking until you are about four, three, four, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, you had to fight even from a young age. Even from to, to you know other toddlers are doing it in ten months naturally, twelve months, etc. Even from a young age, life was a battle and a fight to get up and on your feet. So you come from a fighting family, um, the Smiths from London and Surrey area, um, respectively. They're a fighting family. Um, tell us, how did you get into it? Oh, I was just born into it. It just happened. That's how travel is done. You pull it somewhere and there's 10, 15, 20 traders there. There'd always be little boys that want to fight and you just, you've done the no, normal thing, you got stuck into them, you had a fight. Well, it's yeah. no, normal for you, but some would, some would quit and back off and cry and not do it, but for you, normal was getting stuck in, was it? Well, yes, I didn't know nothing else. <laughs> um, you didn't know nothing else, so it was natural for you to, it was to fight? It for me to fight. Yeah. As I say, gypsy boys, it was spreading most of us. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm sure there are lots of gypsies fight. We've got three, we've recently had three world champions. Yeah. You know, there was, there was been uh, Andy Lee, Billy Joe Saunders, Tyson Fury. We had the brilliant Johnny Frankham back in his day, who, who was number five in the world. I think, do you think Johnny Frankham, sorry to move from yourself, but do you think if there was that four weight, uh, four titles, um, dispersion, Johnny Franklin would have been a world champion if it was a modern era. Oh yes, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Because yeah. the quality of fight re-beating Chris Finnegan, yeah. you know, um, he had to challenge the, the, the um, Bob Foster who was a brilliant, um, well he was unbeatable when he, Bob Foster at light heavy and Finnegan yeah. chased him so close. So I, I agree with you, but anyway, um, let's remember Johnny Franklin always is a great fighter. Nice to touch on that. Um, and I know he's a close friend of yours. And yeah. probably that's what made me come to that. But, um, yeah, so you, you said it was always there for you to fight. Um, but it's not always there for everybody. You took it quite naturally. At what age, at what age did you, you, you know you were going to be a, an hard man or a boxer? Ten-year-old, eleven-year-old. I knew I always wanted to be a fighter. My dad was a fairground fighter. Yeah. His uncle, all his brothers were fairground fighters, my uncles, my, my uncle Jack was a top pro in his time. So it was, I just had to get into it, me and my brothers, that's how we was, we just, we were just born into it. We just had, had, if we're coming from a family like we got, same as Johnny Franklin, coming from a family like he had, he had to be a fighter, he didn't know, he don't know nothing else, we're gypsies, that's what we are. Are you yeah. sure you know that? Well, of course, I'm a gypsy myself, and um, but I know lots of gypsies that uh, would would rather not fight than have one. <laughs> but a lot of them do <laughs> to the norm, you know, to the percentage. I mean, there was a lot of discrimination, a lot of persecution over the years for the gypsy, and I think it naturally made them fight more than normal. They had to fight to get half even. I understand that, yeah. but I still there's still a lot that wouldn't. But it was natural to you. You felt. Now tell me, you mm -hmm. had a lot of fights. You your first amateur fight aged. Thirteen. Thirteen. And you had, how many amateur fights did you have, Jimmy? Oh, probably t roughly two hundred. Two hundred. And 
your, your brother Wally, I'll touch on Wally a bit, because he was an extremely talented Wally Boxer England, represented England he against did, America. He did against America, yeah. And how many fights did Wally have? I'd say I had a, a little few more than Wally. I, I probably had 20, 30 for more fights than Wally. Um, so he's around a 170, 180 mark, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what I'm going to say here, I obviously know you and I've done research, but the viewer at home don't always know. So I've got to explain what I know, you don't know. So let's get you at home with me in the nicest way. So let's get it straight. Without being the tiniest bit dis disrespectful, you were a decent boxer. Is that fair to say, and not a very good one? Uh, yeah, decent. Would you say? What was your record? Oh, I don't know, about half and half. 50-50. But you rarely ever got stopped in your career. Uh, no. Uh, got stopped once. Um, once only in 200 fights? Yeah. Um, as I say, I probably won half, lost half. Um, that was about it. Was so there were clear signs here, Jimmy, that you were an old man. Because even the hardest, best fighters in the world are one day walk into a right hand and get dropped. Even Ali. Henry Cooper had him out on the floor, yeah. almost out. the hardest, best fighters ever get knocked out. Great Lennox Lewis out, spark out twice. So it's getting stopped once in 200 you fights. You can't miss every punch, in it. Apparently, it wasn't your style to miss, was it? It was to go forward, is that true? Well, I was a walk-on fighter, yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I just go in and keep at it, keep going in, keep going in. So I wasn't a man. Relentless, keep going. Just keep going. 1979, um, Tragedy at home, you, 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 your dad died tragically, and it sent you and your brother Wally on a destructive criminal um, period, journey in your life. And whilst a journalist I'd met, and the late Martin King, was doing some work on your book, he was doing some research in the area of Mitcham, which is where you were staying, sort of southwest of London, between Epsom and Mitcham. And Martin King, I'd done some research, and whilst researching, a policeman had said, a retired policeman, he said, Jimmy Stockings had tamed men that the police force had been trying to tame for 20, 30 years. Was there a side of you, you were a fearless man, but was there a side of you where, having lost your dad tragically, um, and I know he was such a rock to you and your brother, was there a side of you that cared even less at this stage in life? Of course. Yeah? Yeah, my dad was... Was uh, there? He was a uh, support. He was. He was with us. We listened to him. He told us what to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Obviously. And um, he, I say, he made us what we what we are. And uh, yeah. at that time, I mean, I was in. I was meet him, and I was on the piss every night, and uh, smoking a bit of weed. And at the end, of, and and I would fight anybody. And then few t few few people fancied their chances to see me out of condition. Yeah. Uh, come on, start. Um, you you um, is it true? In um, is it true once a gangster come into a pub in around the Mitcham area? So Mitcham, I'm sure all your Londoners know where it is, but for the people in different parts of the country, Mitcham is just southwest of London. It's it's it is in London, the southwest. It's about six miles from the city. Um, a gangster come in. It's a tough, rough town, by the way. Um, a gangster come in, wielding a knife, looking for trouble and looking for somebody, wielding a kitchen knife, and you knocked out the gangster that come looking for trouble with a knife, and you 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 knocked him right out there and then with a knife in his hand. Was that a true story? Yeah, that was true, mate. Yeah. 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 I mean, it takes a lot of bravery. I didn't I didn't think think about it. I just done it. It was done. It had to be done. You can't let somebody fucking put a chip in your guts. They got a fucking chip in their hand. Uh, it takes some. Um, I got lucky and. Done well. It. Well, I think you timed it well, but as you say, let's say if you let's say if you, you sit back and let the, the gangster with the knife wield, and although he didn't come in looking for you, he's looking for others, but he was clearly looking for trouble with a knife. Let's pretend that if you, you if you let him go a bit, he might well have used the knife on you or others, yeah? But um, you struck, you got the timing right. But it takes some sort of special um, fearlessness, doesn't it, I think, to, to chin somebody with a kitchen knife. But anyway, you chinned him, knocked him, KO'd him, sparked him, yeah? And his reputation went down after that a bit? Yeah, he was a fucking um, a lunatic. Man was a fucking psycho. But you were a bigger one by knocking him out with yeah. that one armed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you met Firewood Fire there, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. 
his name was Magoo. Yeah. They used to call him Mad Magoo. <laughs> Brian Magoo. Well, talking about Magoo, didn't you have a, a fight with a, another gangster, an armed robber that, that based himself around my side of London? He's from the north of England. Steve Maguire in prison. You'd done a stint in prison, didn't, I didn't did, you? Yeah. How'd you get on with Steve Maguire? Didn't like him. No? No, he wasn't my sort of person. He was a gym orderly. Right. And uh, them gym orderlies in prison, with most cons know, are fit as a flea. And uh, he made it plain that he didn't like me. And I didn't like him anyway. Fuck him. So um, this was going on for about a few weeks. So he ends up on the same wing as me. Yeah. Next cell to me. So I'm got up in the morning and I'm mopping the, 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 the landing up, landing, and um, he comes out of his cell and tells me, oh, you, where you put that, move that bucket. And I said, go and fuck yourself. Right, yeah, as, as you do, right, yeah. yeah. So I banged on the door, and out, out he come, bang, we get out it in the hallway, and I'm holding my own. He's only a young fella, he's very fit, anyway, I'm holding my own, and I, only thing I could do, he's got me around the neck and I can't fucking breathe. And I've reached down as far as I the girl there, I've reached as far as I could get and I grabbed his balls and I squeezed them as hard as I could and he got up and run off <laughs> in the cell. And, he, and I was banging on the door for him to come out and he wouldn't come out. Anyway, I go to work and then later on that night when I come back from work, I was on an outside party. I come back from work, he's on the gates and he said to me, can I have a word with you for a minute? I said, yeah. I said, what do you want? He said, I've got too much to lose. He said, you've got too much to lose. He said, can, can, can we forget it? Well, so I just said, don't worry about it. It never happened. Okay. Happened. So did you get on all right after that? Was oh, not really, but no. I, 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 we didn't have any more fights. Yeah, I, I mean, I personally didn't know him, but... Um, I was told he was a tough, rough man. Yeah, but, um, he was. And so are you. So let's um, touch on one of the best, I'm told, bloodiest battles ever to hit London Town knuckle fight was between you and Creamy Eastwood, Tom Eastwood. Yeah. Um, and what I do know about um, Tom Eastwood is unbeaten, Creamy Eastwood, was unbeaten as a professional. Um, he'd beaten Andy Gerrard twice, a Welsh heavyweight who actually fought, I've just seen recently watched him fight, he had a brilliant fight with Gary Mason and Andy Gerrard, and I was amazed when I see that uh, a creamy, who's my cousin, I know very well was he my cousin, who I'd seen fight Andy Gerrard, when, when, when he beat Andy Gerrard twice, I just realised how good he was, because Andy Gerrard was a serious fighter who, who went the full route with Gary Mason, I think the ref intervened with seconds ago and he should never have done so, good fighter, and inspiring Tom Creamy Eastwood, hit Gary Mason so hard, he knocked him down. Now, for you viewers at home, Gary Mason sadly lost his life on a bike accident in Greater London, yeah. Um, he was an unbeaten heavyweight, and he lost to the brilliant, one of the all-time greats, Lennox Lewis, and it was a really good fight, there wasn't much in it, and he got stopped on cuts, never went, never, never got put on the floor. So Lennox Lewis couldn't put Gary Mason on the floor, God bless him, he was a good fighter but Tom Creamy Eastwood did, that's how hard he could punch. But you had a fight with Tom Creamy Eastwood on a gypsy site in Mitchum, was it? Yes, right, yes, Stratton, London. And one of the bloodiest fights ever seen, but most of the blood was coming from you. Tell us what happened in that fight, how did it go? Oh, well, we just got together and for a few seconds eyeing him up, he's eyeing me up, and I walked on the shot and bang, I goes over, uh, shakes me head and Gets up, they or cut, they uh, want to stop it. No, I'm carrying on, I've got to start back in. And we got at it for about three quarters of an hour. And uh, I was getting a bit better towards the end of the fight. And um, I just put everything into one shot, and uh, that was the end of that. Well, uh, but, a, but, a, but a legend <coughs> of a man and a real tough, tough man. But the. the more importantly, you remain to this day a good friend. You, yeah. You're still mates to this day, yeah. which is which is good. So there was no sour grapes there. In fact, you went straight straight from from the fight and met up later on for a for a drink. Yeah. For a drink. But all all the, the the neutral crowd that were there, 
I wasn't there. I was, I was old enough to remember it, but I there, weren't, there I weren't about, at the fight. There was about 400 people there, I'll say, and, and every single one afterwards stood and kept clapping and clapping. What I was told, it was, it was, it was a brutal fight. But it, most people that were there couldn't believe and understand how you withstood the punishment of this beautiful, brilliant, great, big, strong boxer, how you withstood his punishment. People were amazed where you got the punch resistance from. Was it true you were even giving three punches in terms of putting your chin up? I mean I three, did, yeah. like um, three hits. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Just, sure. to, just to try and win yeah, the psychology yeah, battle. Yeah. Yeah. Blimey. Is that... What is, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that crazy or bravery? I don't know. Uh, a bit I of think, each? I think it's a bit of each, But <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say, no, well, more importantly, you become very good friends. And after that fight, Tom Creamy East would perform so well, I don't think hardly anybody messed around with him anymore. He didn't get many fights no, after that. And the I ones he did, I don't think he had the punch resistance you had. They went uh, uh, up and over a bit lively, <laughs> no, yeah? Nobody else but me would be silly enough to fight him, would they? So you, you won, you won all, all your knuckle fights that was put, and there was lots of them, because you were doing it from a young boy. You, you, you self-confessed and loved the fight, yeah? yeah. Um, you know, I'm not saying you're an aggressive man walking the streets up and down in public, but you actually loved the straight fight, you actually loved it. So if there was one on offer, you would take it at the drop of a net. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't walk away from it. You won all your fights, yeah, clearly not. You won all your fights, except you had a defeat against, your one and only defeat against Johnny Love. And that too, from another side of London, North London, that too was one of the bloodiest fights ever seen. Yeah. And um, there was a, well, this is bravery. I mean, if the Tom Creamy Eastwood was showing fight was showing bravery, this was showing bravery even uh, more. Tell us what happened early in that fight with one of the first punches. Uh, again, I got caught early and uh, and over on me, hit me head, and the blood squirted out the back of me, and I fractured my skull later on. I went to the hospital, and I had a fractured skull. And um, the, the fight carried on. They wanted to stop it, I wouldn't have it, and then I'd put him down. When you say they, what, the fair play men and yeah. other people, yeah? I put him down, I had him out. Yeah. And uh, I let him cover, say, 10, 20, 30 seconds, and he, probably a bit longer than that. Ask Tommy Brown, he'll tell you. Anyway, the, the, he, he got up in the Tom end. Brown was a fair play man, was he? Yeah, yeah. And he got up in the end, and uh, we carried on, and that went on for a while, and three quarter, hour and three quarters, that went on for. And so nearly a two hour fight. Yeah, and again I was getting better as the fight went on. And uh, at, the, at the end of it, my eyes was fucked. I couldn't see. My fucking eyes was up here. The blood was coming. I couldn't see that. I couldn't so see. So you couldn't see? I couldn't see. Well, I can't fight what well, I can't see. So I, I said, well, I'll call it a day. But I didn't give bed. So I said, I can't fight what well, I can't see. So I was out of stop. Yeah, so you were forced to stop. I was forced to stop. Yeah, you, so I you didn't want to stop, obviously, but you were I forced. I didn't want to stop, but I had to stop because I couldn't see the man, you know what I mean? So then you arranged to go for a drink after, in yeah. good old-fashioned, and but you you, you, um, you had to go and get no, stitched. I had to go to the hospital and I'd get stitched up, and I had a fracture. They, they'd done an x-ray, and I had a fractured skull. So, so there we go. Viewers at home, we're fighting for one nearly two hours, one hour, three quarters, against Johnny Lovedell. Johnny Love, um, for your information, was a professional boxer, become a professional boxer, not a usually experienced amateur. He became a professional boxer and there was a programme run by the BBC, Dangerous of Boxing, and they showed one of Johnny Love's punches. He knocked out his opponent out cold for about 20 minutes and thankfully the boxer came round, it was all right. But it just highlighted how hard he punched and Jim walked onto one, went down fractured skull, which is, in you're really seriously endangering your life there, Jimmy, but you carried on. And you shook hands, you was forced into defeat, not by your ambitions, you couldn't see, you couldn't fight. You and Johnny Love remained friends after that, you shook yeah, hands and... Yeah, yeah, it was alright, it was good as gold after that. So you, you, yeah, so you got on well, you got on well when you met out there after, you yeah, and John. Yeah. And sadly he died, he died in, um, in circumstances uh, as a young man, John, bless him. Yeah, um, circumstances slightly unknown to me, but there wasn't natural causes, bless him. So... Uh, you, you come from a family of fighters. Your son um, was a fighter, um, and I think he'd done you proud, just like father, like son. He had never um, been stopped as an amateur or professional. I think he had around 100 amateur and professional fights. Your son, yeah, maybe just yeah, over, yeah. Just under, I think. Just I under. I don't think he had 100. 
So, um, what, what, what was it? Maybe 80 amateur fights? Either about 70, 80 fights, yeah. And then 10 professional, 10 or 12 professional? Yeah, I think yeah, 9 professional fights. I think. Yeah. So, so around, around the sort of 90 fights, Mark, ne never ever stopped. Only ever hit the canvas once. Um, never stopped. Uh, fought a split decision to um, the world title contender Joshua Boati, who I believe yeah. will be world champion. That's yeah, a split decision did, to him did. over four rounds. Um, went on to fight for the British Southern Air professional champion. Put up a gallant performance against the highly rated Zach Shelley. So you must have been very proud of your sons. Oh, very, very yeah. proud of them, very. And more importantly, he's a lovely, kind lad. Oh, yeah. he's a gentleman, isn't he? He's, he's, yeah. he's lovely to be around, he's a gentleman, he's never said a bad word to nobody. Yeah, well, that's a pleasure to hear. So um, he's done you proud in more than one way. Oh, 100%. So, <coughs> Jimmy, life treating you good today, all happy, fine and dandy? Oh, lovely, yeah, thanks, yeah. Any regrets in this fistic career, in the fight oh, career? No, I'll do it all over again. Would you? Oh, yeah. Really? So, so if we could chuck a bit of youth back on you and do all the same things again? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, Jimmy, what's the message out there for the youngsters that want to be boxers and people, fans alike? Oh, go to a boxing club and learn to box properly and take notes of your mums and dads and the trainers and... Uh, You'll, go, you'll come along fine. You know, don't fight on the street. Oh, well, that's good sound advice, especially with all the violence and crap and crime we see with knives out there and all that stuff. It's good. These are, these, are, these are words from an hard man amongst hard men. This is a man that's knocked people out wielding knives and he's telling you not to fight in the streets. I think that's very, very sound, good advice. Our guest today, I hope you've enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, hard men amongst hard men, Mr. Jimmy Stockings. Thank you, Jimmy, for joining us. Thanks, Bogner. Stay tuned next time.